I'd like to start this year's show by dedicating it to Mark Harrison. Mark was a staff photographer at the Seattle Times for over 25 years. He retired just three years ago. Mark was an extremely passionate man, and he was most uh, at home behind his camera or on his boat out on the water. Mark knew the natural beauty of the Puget Sound extremely well, and he always seemed to have great advice on where to find a bald eagle or a snowy owl. Mark passed away two weeks ago. But, <laughs> but we will keep his memory and his vision alive. Please join me in honoring Mark and thanking his family for being here tonight. Thank you. This Pictures of the Year event has become a tradition that we look forward to every year. And I am so excited to be here at the Pacific Science Center with all of you. Similar to the Science Center, the Seattle Times has long been dedicated to a mission of spreading knowledge and building community. We investigate. We illuminate. We explore the issues that are important to you. Our goal as photo and video journalists is to invite you into Seattle Times reporting by ensuring that every person who lives here, every person, sees themselves and their neighbors in our coverage. We are committed to creating news, not just for some, but for all. When you come to the Seattle Times, whether it's on your phone, on your laptop, or with a newspaper over a cup of coffee. We want you to know you belong in this city. We want you to recognize the neighborhoods you know. We want to take you to the neighborhoods that you should know better. We want to build up this city by including everyone in her story. Now there's three and a half million of you and only about two dozen of us on the photo and video staff. And so it's a challenge. But it's a responsibility that we take very seriously, and we continuously push ourselves to be better. Our photojournalists, they connect to communities throughout the area to learn where to go, but also when to be there and who to meet when they arrive. Some of the photos we make, they're stumbled upon. And sometimes they surprise even us. Others can take months and months of planning. But we hope that every one of these images helps form our community and elevates all of the people who make it great. And now, I'd like to share with you some of our favorite moments that we've had the privilege of documenting in 2018.
I'd now like to introduce my friend and my colleague, Alan Berner. Alan has been a staff photographer at the Seattle Times for 37 years. He just released his second book, The Story How a Very Cute Little Baby Otter Was Rescued. As a picture editor, I get the privilege of seeing the world through Alan's photos every day, and it is an amazing vantage point. Please welcome photojournalist Alan Berner. I've spent half my life at the Seattle Times. Uh, what I liked about Seattle when I came for the job interview uh, was that people in the urban environment looked like they were ready to camp. And, it, and what I liked about the paper was that it had uh, a growing commitment to the visual reporting. And it literally has been a ticket to the world for me. Uh, I once traveled around the world for two months for Earth Day on a wacky proposal I had made. And Bill Dietrich was the writer, and we produced a special section from that. What I love about photography is it's an undertaking of exploration and discovery. Uh, newspaper reporting comes with the highest level of responsibility. It's collaborative, it's creative, it's competitive. Uh, I get to see and experience things uh, most people don't and report on them. Uh, it's a way to reflect our community. It's a way to distill an event to its essence. Uh, we try to solve the puzzle of a situation, uh, getting to the heart of it. So what I'm going to show today or tonight mostly are uh, single images where the attempt is to get that single image. They're not from stories. Um, and then there'd be a growing essay around it for online. So thank you for coming. And let's look at pictures. This is on Kite Hill. Uh, depending on the caption, you might think it's a political statement of our time, but it's not. And the headline said, Facelift for Lady Liberty, and she's getting in a boost up as she's inflating. This is one of the great events that happens every year. And if you have a chance, you should afford yourself the opportunity to go to uh, Seattle Center on July 4th at noon to see 500 new citizens sworn in. This is Ann Waiaki from Kenya, appropriately dressed, wonderfully dressed. It was indoors uh, two years ago because they were fearful of rain, which did not happen. It's almost always outside in the courtyard in front of Fisher Pavilion. This is Mrs. Abdi, center. Her kids are already uh, citizens, and she was uh, new here, uh, uh, a new citizen sworn in from Somalia. And there's a giant flag that hangs in the armory, uh, and people who become new citizens, love to go and stand in front of it, and family members take portraits of them. It's a portrait of new America, too. Well, he's from New York City, and uh, the way I came to this situation was uh, picture editor Fred Nelson called and said there's a, st a statue or a depiction of Donald Trump up on Capitol Hill near uh, the Comet Tavern, and I wasn't far away. Ten minutes later, I called him and said, it's a very good depiction. <laughs> it, uh, it's problematic, and I'm, and I'm going to be here a couple of hours. And then please ask Angie Gottschalk to save space. It'll be tomorrow's local cover if it works out. This is the first women's march two years ago, and half a dozen of us from the photo department covered it in, vid in video and stills, and Angie had asked if I could find a, an overview. And it's far and away the biggest march I have ever seen. It went on for four hours, 150,000 people guaranteed. And I drove the route uh, three times, uh, walked much of it, and then found a spot on 4th Avenue and brought a stepladder. Uh, step stool so I'd be about seven feet high and could shoot over people and not be blocked and make this overview. This is Mitzi Johanknik. She is now King County Sheriff. And writer Susan Kelleher and I went to her uh, 
I guess, ostensibly victory celebration, although no one felt it was going to be that because uh, the only other person there covering this, there was no TV there, there was one radio person and the two of us, and we thought everyone must think she's going to lose. And she was hoping to be within 10,000 votes of the incumbent. This is the moment she saw the, f the first vote drop and she's 10,000 votes ahead and feels she's on her way to victory, which she was. And it was a big risk running against John Urquhart. And to this day, John Urquhart, who was the sheriff, has never called, uh, congratulated her, or uh, issued any sort of, uh, he did not concede. So, who knew Darth Vader took an elevator? But I'll tell you, if you see Darth Vader in an elevator, wait for the next car. <laughs> because... So this is from Comic-Con. People love to dress up in costumes. This is last month at... Uh, yeah, exactly. If you're, if you're that kid in that stroller, I'm, I don't know what kind of life experience you're going to have after this. That's Batman in a $15 sales suit that he bought after Halloween on reduction. Wolverine. So people at these con conventions that are immensely popular uh, love to dress up and pose. They spend a lot of money on costumes. He came from sunny, uh, Sunnyside. But when they pose as a Marvel comic figure or a superhero, it's to me is really boring. And what I wait for, and I think is far more interesting, is if they're doing normal human things, like trying to use a cell phone when, you're, when your uh, blades don't retract. <laughs> if you like fireworks, don't do this. Uh, Asia Fields and I were set out to cover uh, the dangers of can happen with fireworks for the 4th of July. And we drove down to Muckleshoot, and you can see the litter down below. This is a legal area to shoot off stuff. And I saw this gentleman and immediately went over there. I mean, it's one of the first pictures made, and uh, he called it the Arm of Thanos. <laughs> and it shoots off, it's homemade, obviously, and it's a PVC pipe, and he would shoot off five mortars with a total cost of 75 bucks. And I thought, I need a wide-angle shot at a slower shutter speed and get as close as I can to him, but the risk is we will be candidates if it blows up for the, uh, the Darwin Award, which is, uh, those are posthumous awards given every year uh, to people who did incredibly stupid things. Good God, that is Joe Sprague from Everett, Washington. And uh, I was covering, as I've done many times, Tattoo Expo at the Seattle Center. And he saw me photographing the large tattoo uh, competition and came over and said, what do you think? And I said, it's a, it's a really good likeness. <laughs> and Mr. Sprague said, very few people get to see this. So I thanked him. <laughs> and uh, there's not much more to say. This is the first performer last year, the band, Joe Past from uh, Vancouver, B.C. They had to open at 11 a.m. at Sub Pop's 30th anniversary. And the, the, the bassist here got tripped up in her wiring and fell, but it looked like it was part of the performance. And when they were done with this really incredible set, uh, the, the two lead singers embraced, and I couldn't be closer to the stage because it's, it's a small venue, early in the morning, and it's great to hear a band that you've never heard before and they just knocked it out of the park. So this is uh, Amy the Pig. <laughs> and the importance of headlines, Amy the Pig, the headline said top dog in class. And, and Amy the Pig, uh, only knew about it because we used to have a pet columnist, Ranny Green, retired, and he called a couple of days before and said there is this pig, this pet pig in a dog obedience class in Kent, and it's the, it's the best student in the class. 
but the punchline is the, I'm not sure, Chihuahua mix or whatever it is, looking over wondering, you know, what the hell kind of breed is that over there? <laughs> If you're a resident at the zoo, uh, odds are you're going to live much longer uh, than animals in the wild because you have vet care, you have nutritionists, vet techs, uh, constant care, and that's what's happening here. Uh, animals live much longer than they do in the wild, so they've developed massage and laser therapy. Uh, Harmony Fraser has developed that. And, this is something I will never ever see in my lifetime again. It's an incredible uh, opportunity to see a 150 pound, seven foot long Komodo dragon, dangerous animals generally, receiving and enjoying, apparently, massage therapy. As is uh, Amarillo the armadillo on an exercise wheel, staying fit. Arctic fox, stretching exercises daily stretching exercises. I didn't know they had domestic goats there. Same thing, uh, Harmony on the right is giving a massage therapy to this goat as uh, its keeper is taking care of it. This is at a you cut, you cut, you carry uh, lot up in North Bend. Now, at the same tree farm approximately six or seven years earlier, I had also covered this for Christmas, and Rick Lunn, one of our um, fine headline writers, wrote only 12 more chopping days till Christmas. <laughs> he could have recycled that for this. It would have been good. You have to avoid encumbrances if you're a dog walker. This is a dog walker on Capitol Hill. He takes them on a three-mile walk, and, uh, but they're leashed all the time. This is no free range. And following him on the whole course, at one point, he had to step over the leashes to avoid encumbrance. This is the leash law uh, being observed in the town of Edison, north here, north of here. And it's a great event you can go to next month. It is the Edison Chicken Parade. <laughs> it, it, it's a, you know, whatever, three hour round trip drive for a 10 minute parade that's only two blocks long. But you'll see stuff you'll never see again, including uh, <laughs> if you go get a chicken outfit and join the parade. I thought of this as Uber on Vashon Island. But what it is is uh, that's Joe Yarkin and his sheep, Noodle. And Noodle, I was following Noodle around for a magazine story uh, writer and I did on uh, Vashon Island. Noodle was a candidate for mayor. And not that good a candidate, came in second. And then uh, Joe called me up to give me the results and said he thought that there had been vote stuffing by senior centers on Vashon. We did not investigate further. A couple... Of, a couple from uh, the Rollers, they were celebrating their 46th wedding anniversary. They came down to the Pike Market. And it's a lot easier to get onto Rachel than it is to get off. <laughs> so here are two cowboys in Pendleton, Oregon. And uh, writer Eric Lasitas and I went down to the Pendleton Roundup. And Hamley's is a famous Western salary in downtown Pendleton. And I walked, there's, there's only one couch in there, and self-respecting cowboys don't sit on a couch, they sit on saddles. And I walked in, and I am dressed appropriately. Appropriately means I'm dressed just like the gentleman on the left. I have on uh, boots, jeans, long sleeve shirt, and a cowboy hat. Because if you are credentialed for a rodeo, you can go pretty much everywhere and if you're not dressed that way, those are professional rodeo cowboy association rules, you can only sit in the stands. And the person on the right, Doug Brown, he is a former world champion bull rider in the Rodeo call, uh, Hall of Fame. And I asked him, I'd like to take your portrait, and I did. But they know, there's no fool, I'm not trying to fool them or anything, they know uh, 
they know I own a Honda CRV and I'm from the city. And he said, I'm going to take a picture of you here, climb aboard. And he invited me to climb aboard. And what I did not realize, since I've never done that on a saddle and a salary, is that they don't cinch him on the bottom. And he knew I'd do a 180 <laughs> to the ground. It's okay, it's fair. I thought it was fair. And I'd run into people for the th three days I was there. And they uh, would say, do you know that writer? Is that writer really with the Seattle Times? And I said, you mean that writer dressed uh, with khaki pants, sandals, a blue blazer, and a white shirt? That was Eric Lasitas. He has two outfits. That's, that's <laughs> both of them. And I would totally deny that I knew him. Because <laughs> this is the scene in downtown Pendleton. For 10 bucks, you can ride uh, a mechanical bull. These two gentlemen make a living doing this around the country. This is at the Washington State Rodeo, formerly the Puyallup. This is right before the annual parade. It's a gig, a good one. That's Bill Jarko, who also makes a full-time living as a giant uh, chicken on stilts. And he does about 45 minutes at a session before he has to get off of the stilts. Fatigue. And I followed him around for his whole uh, session throughout the uh, fairgrounds. And then um, a cleanup person happened to walk by to com complete the image. <laughs> I wanted to do a story on old time plowing with draft horses. And, and through the Draft Horse Association of Washington State was able to find uh, Richard Cameron in Ellensburg but uh, this was the first time he had brought his horses out for the season, and he only done that one furrow that's right behind him, and the old plow broke, and he got a sleigh ride across the ground, but was uninjured, other than his car hearts were, were torn up a bit. But had he been injured, I'm, I'm sure we would not have published this. We would not be in the business of doing that. And that ran six columns uh, by about four and a half inches across the page. Twenty-five pound Chinook that's uh, being displayed to the visitors last year who've come to the Issaquah Hatchery. To some people's amazement, and, and it, it, that is an, um, one large Chinook, sixty feet wide here by three and a half stories. That sort of, it just <laughs> knocks me out. And, and thank you, Pacific Science Center. This is a great venue for photography. Some of the things we cover are not for everything, uh, not for everyone. Uh, Sandy Doughton, located at Central Washington University, there are graduate students who are doing research on rattlesnakes. This is a, this is a northern Pacific rattlesnake. And these guys, are, they were wearing shorts and uh, running shoes. I felt totally confident with them, no problem whatsoever. And this is in the coolies, Frenchman coolie, uh, east of Vantage. And I uh, said, you know, so what happens if we get bitten or something? And they said, you're not going to get bitten, but if you do, don't run. Remain calm. We'll drive you to the hospital in Ellensburg, and it'll, it'll be fine, but it, nobody's going to get bitten. What they do is they coax these rattlesnakes into these tubes so they can uh, measure them, weigh them, get a DNA sample. And... It's astonishing how many rattlesnakes are out there. I mean, they would find them everywhere that I couldn't see. They blend in so well. And up on the hillside, there are people on blankets having picnics. And I th well, the rattlesnake doesn't want to see you any more than you want to see the rattlesnake in general. Uh, but I am never going to go camping at Frenchman Cooley, I can tell you that. <laughs> The henna artist here is Saba Naz. She speaks four languages. And I was looking for a story at the um, shop next door and peeked in and saw her and the henna, for, the henna artist uh, doing these great patterns for Eid. And Marilyn Monroe on the, uh, on the wall. And uh, wound up doing a, a feature on her and her artistry, and I asked people about Marilyn Monroe. Most, almost all of them had no idea who Marilyn Monroe was, but they believed 
She was a great symbol of glamour, which is true to this day. Rose Rakshika preparing, also getting henna adornments for her wedding, which was two days after this. And that took four to five hours, which I spent the entire time with her as it, and she was waited on hand and foot, fed, cell phone usage. And when this moment happened, we have the various arms coming in and the two arms down below. Uh, whether I'm reading into it or not, I saw it as Shiva, the uh, Indian god, a representation. This is one of the few long lens pictures. It's up at the uh, giant pumpkin way off in Mount Vernon last year, and it just came, that's the pumpkin that came in second. And when the child reached in and touched it, shot it long lens, just, it's just a sense of uh, scale, which the little hand provided. These are radio control boats on the little pond in South Lake Union, and retired from the Seattle Times, Bill Cosson, another great headline writer, he wrote All Hands on Deck. Which, ma which makes it better, it makes the, the whole package better. And uh, readers, I think, tend to see and read the photograph first, or the photograph and the headline first, and if they're taken with it, maybe they'll read the caption, then they'll read the caption. And if they're really interested or taken by the whole uh, photo and the headline, then they'll read the text. Mr. Buell, he built this. He's a retired boiler maker, and he built this one-eighth scale engine over a five-year period from scratch. And in the summer, you can go to Port Orchard and ride these uh, by donation. There is a club, the Kitsap Live Steamers. The second, they do it twice a month. You'd have to look it up. One of the quirkiest events in the state is in the tiny town of Lind, 60 miles west of Spokane. It's the Combine Demolition Derby, where, uh, well, there's about six to seven hours of this event. So it's a, it's a lot of demolition and then repair and more demolition until there's only one left standing. And for some reason, I bought 20 tickets to support the FFA uh, fundraiser there and the winning ticket would get a combine, it was in Seattle Times Blue, to r drive the next year. And a son of a gun, if we didn't win, <laughs> we won. Ron Judd came up with the name of our uh, team. My other combine is a Volvo. And then <laughs> we were going to buy suits at Value Village, or use the suit I have from Value Village, and then go and drive the combine. But we, had, we could not invest a week's worth of time for learning how to drive a combine. The fire lecture and then the actual event. Last one standing. I love covering graduations actually. It's really terrific to go to an event where people uh, enjoy you being there and it's celebratory and it's uh, engaging and it's fun. The University of Washington used to hold two sessions in heck ed, back to back. And they didn't hold them outdoors in the stadium because they were worried it was going to rain someday. Well, it eventually it did rain, and this is the first time, and it just let loose. And it was very hard to get this professor's name through his little cocoon that he opened for me. And I knew immediately when the heavens opened that I had to go up and get the dignitaries on stage who were really trapped in their rain gear. And that's what we ran the next day on uh, Sunday Local Cover. Two graduates just filled with glee at Seattle Pacific University. And I was just walking by, ready, actually heading to my car. And... Uh, they both were considering their options. Where should they go for graduate school? They had multiple options. This is also at Seattle Pacific University. His parents, I'm sure, are very proud and they're $200,000 in debt. 
And he was easy to spot. Yeah, had I thought of it, I would recommend that he go to Comic-Con. <laughs> Adrian Claxton. I, I simply was just chatting with him, talking with him, waiting for things to uh, get going in Husky Stadium when he spots his wife, his kids, and his mom in the stands. And it's an exuberant moment, dual major, and that was Sunday's local cover as well. This was not Sunday local cover. This ran five inches by three and a half inches. It was an assistant city editor's idea to cover this Guinness World Record attempt at most nudists in a pool in Issaquah at, uh, fratern uh, called Fraternity Snoqualmie. But it's not that that's such a great picture. Uh, the amazing thing to me was the response that the... Uh, keepers of commas and decency at the Seattle Times, which I call the copy desk. And what they did was it was on a two-foot screen being enlarged and moved about to make sure we didn't offend anyone's sensibilities and that it would be a proper to, to publish. It didn't go online. It only went at the bottom of the local cover, which is amazing in its own way. And the question is, why? what are we doing back? What are, what are Nancy Bartley, retired from the Seattle Times, what, what are we doing at the Fraternity Snoqualmie? What is the news peg on this place? And I show this for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it's a solution to a problem because it is not possible to photograph uh, nudists playing volleyball in an acceptable manner for the <laughs> daily paper. There's a deductive reasoning question here, too. Where's the fourth volleyballer? And also, what really, and it's about context, too, because uh, the parents of a colleague at work came up, whom I'd met before a couple of times, and I didn't recognize him because of the context. They were only wearing Birkenstocks. And I promised that they would not be photographed, and they weren't. And our jobs are really at the paper often filled with joy. You think of, uh, and this was one of our great summer interns last year, Sarah Wu, who is Canadian and also a student at Harvard. And we're on a B-17, and the, and the opening here is because it's over the radio operator's compartment. And this was just uh, air conditioning provided on the flight, 25-minute flight. Sarah has been editor of the paper at Harvard. She's Canadian, and amazingly, she never once mentioned that she was a student at Harvard. This is friend and colleague. It's the last picture I want to show of Alex Tizon. He, would, uh, he died two years ago this coming March, and this was at his book launch at Elliott Bay, book signing and book launch. And it, this gesture to me just reflected his openness to new ideas, new people, new experiences. And I thought, what a great way to be. Well, thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. It's also my distinct pleasure and I love having the opportunity of introducing colleague Corinne Chin. And how often can you say somebody was enticed to come from Nairobi, from the Associated Press, she was working in Nairobi, to come and join us at the Seattle Times. And Corinne has only been at the paper four years, but you'll see through the work that she has, is going to show us all what an intense and important impact she has had on visual reporting at the Seattle Times. Corinne. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, Alan. I decided to move here four years ago for two main reasons. Number one, the Seattle Times' excellent reputation as a visual paper earned over decades of strong work by photographers like Alan and like Mark Harrison. And number two, 
the opportunity to produce work about and for my local community. There's something really special about seeing the impact of our journalism up close. And so thank you all for being with us tonight. So you may recognize some of my work from the past four years from our 2016 interactive web documentary, Under Our Skin, where video editor Lauren Frohn and I led an exploration of the words that we use to talk about race. Or from this peak backstage at the Pacific Northwest Ballet, where video journalist Ramon Dompor, who edited that slideshow, and I did a deep dive into Swan Lake's famous 32 fuetes. Or from this 2015 series exploring what defines Pacific Northwest cuisine. From photojournalist Ellen Banner's trip to Bainbridge Island to visit George the skateboarding dog. <laughs> or from this visual ode to Seattle based on the poetry of Washington State Poet Laureate Claudia Castro Luna, filmed by Seattle Times staff. At the Seattle Times, we strive to make video stories that are cinematic, evergreen, inclusive, and deeply personal. This is how we want to add value to your lives and how we want to bring you the news. Here is one example of the work we do. This story was filmed with Ramon. Since Sue Bird was in Yukon's team her first year out here, we followed her ever since. She's a champion. She's at the top of her game as the most senior player in the game. They are such role models for girls of all ages, whether you're young and just starting the game, or whether you've been playing the game, or whether you're somebody like me who loves to watch the game. They're such great role models for all women. We're I'm Kent Lee, and we play basketball. <laughs> yeah, having my own hometown team win is so like inspirational, and it means like, oh yeah, I can be there one day. They're really good at it, and they've won like three championships. They're the best. <laughs> the Seahawks have won. The Mariners have none. This Seattle Storm team made the entire region fall in love with them. This used to be a niche basketball team. It is a niche basketball team no longer. This is a bona fide sport in this city and this country, and it will be forever. I believe that as visual journalists, we have a responsibility to take you to places where you'd rather not go. Places that may not be as visually stunning as these places that may be unfamiliar, places that may hurt, places where we can learn and grow into better members of our community. Our video stories show how deep-seated pain from the past can empower people in the present. Here's a clip from a video story that we published last month. It's remarkable how little attitudes have changed towards people coming here from other countries. Talking about birthright citizenship, 
talking about uh, people who are naturalized being deported, the unaccompanied minors. People need to see that we've done this before. It didn't work. It's not working now. We can't keep doing this. When I first came and quickly found out the amount of files here are enormous. There are about 50,000 files, so we've been indexing the files and it, it's probably going to take a long time <laughs> to finish. Every Chinese person that came through specified ports because of the Chinese Exclusion Act had to go through interrogations and interviews. The act was passed in 1882 to exclude Chinese laborers. When someone left the country, they'd have their photo taken so that when they came back in, they could see if they were the same person. A file would be created, all the names that the person had, and their date of birth, where they were born, their occupation, the ship they came in on, and they might have a birth certificate or maps from their village. Reporter Daniel Beekman and I actually started working on this story almost two years ago. We met with the volunteers and we were so charmed by them, they were so kind that we knew it would make a great story, but bigger news got in the way, among them a new mayor for Seattle. But with 2018 marking the 75th anniversary of the repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act, we knew we wanted to revisit this story, and it was amazing how much the political news of the day served to make the story feel that much more relevant and rich. This story and this image from the National Archives in particular felt deeply relevant to me for a different reason. It reminded me a lot of this photo. That's me. When I was that age, and for a very long time after that, the thought of being a journalist had never crossed my mind. My family didn't subscribe to the paper. We didn't see ourselves in it. Half a century after the repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act, whenever I picked up a magazine, it fascinated me. Not because it felt relevant to me, but because it read like a guide that demystified how the majority lived. Growing up, I felt like an outsider looking in. I felt this way all through journalism school, and I often still do today. That's why it's important for us as journalists to reflect the region we cover. And that's why this work is so important to me today. The best journalism moves people to feel, and maybe even to act. And I want people to feel like they belong here. As an industry, we need to do better so that every child can grow up feeling like they belong in their communities. Here's a short clip from the project Artifacts of Injustice, which we published this summer. In this clip, you'll meet Jeffrey Cooper Smith, a local attorney who's been amassing this incredible historical collection for more than four decades. These were known as Middle Passage shackles. This set of shackles is for kids. And you can see, uh, you can imagine rather, what it would be like to have these on and uh, how they chafed. I can't fathom how someone would ever put those shackles on another human being. I, every time I feel the impact. <laughs> As you can see, it's, it's terrible. I mean, to see the, the, the cruelty and the, and the repression. I mean, how could one human ever do that to another human? Um, it's just... That I can't make sense of. They were some extraordinary people whose names we don't know, whose fates we don't know. And it's those stories that are just so powerful. Somebody wore those shackles.
somebody wore those shackles. There's a lot of difficult questions to ask ourselves about our own responsibility and what we inherited and how we're going to be looked upon. I'd encourage you all to visit the website here to explore the full collection of artifacts with photos by Bettina Hansen, web development by Thomas Wilburn, and the text by retired columnist Jerry Large. I wanted to show this story because I think it shows that we all have a role to play in how we shape our community, no matter how distant the issues may feel from us personally. When video editor Lauren Frone and I wrote a summary of our 2018 videos of the year, we said, our video stories offer viewers a chance to understand others' lives and experiences, to linger in corners of our community that are often overlooked. These short documentaries provide opportunities for viewers to gain new perspectives on pressing issues. Our stories hold up a mirror to viewers illuminating the areas they have the power to change. But not every story about communities of color needs to be dark and depressing. And if you watch the rest of these two stories, you'll find that they move past darkness. It's really important to highlight resilience and strength. As journalists, we don't just bring you the news. We also decide what's important enough to be considered news. We choose what is worthy of coverage, and we choose how to cover those stories for our audience. This story was filmed with photojournalist Erica Schultz. come up to me, eh, why are you trying to lift that heavy? You're trying to look like a man. This man walked up to me and goes, women should not be lifting weights. I don't yeah. think they like it when they notice that a woman is stronger than them. We really don't care, you know, what people have to say. I'm Sachie Dubose, and I'm a three-time powerlifting world champion. My name is Shisato Dubose. I am a powerlifter, and recently I turned to the professional bodybuilding bikini athlete, master athlete. When Erica met Sachi and Shisato, she was actually on a different assignment, but we immediately knew that this would make a great story a mother-daughter duo who are breaking records and winning world championships in powerlifting. But it wasn't until we sat down for the interview and really listened to them that we understood what the story was really about. It's not just a story about physical strength. It's about how strength, mental, spiritual strength, defines who these women are and what they mean to each other. Here's another clip from that story. When she was two, I became a single mom, and I have uh, five children. My oldest was 16, and she was only two. So here I am, she's a single mom, and after 17 years in the Mary, and it was very challenging. Yeah. All women and mothers, especially the mothers, when they come down to the wheel, push against the wall, we just become super women, right? Like, I don't even know where the strength came from. Just do what we have to do. I think that's what drove me into the gym too, because it's once again, okay, my children really have only me. So I have to stay healthy, and, you know, stay strong. I want to set the example, because that's the only thing that I can live when I'm in the next life. 
and single mom, I'm a little rich lady, what I can be. I want to leave something valuable, not money or not material. What I can leave is my footstep, my belief, my faith, and my words to my kids. They are my words. And Now you guys know why I wanted to be like her. <laughs> this is another photo by Erica. You can actually catch this full film at the Seattle Asian American Film Festival next month. Our video stories don't just tell stories about processes or how people do things like powerlifting. We tell stories about what drives people and what makes them who they are. Our jobs are to make connections and build relationships. Video stories are just the product of that work. This is the Lopez family from Hoquiam, Washington. Juan, Erica, Arena, and Elijah. Erica, Schultz, and I spent some time with the family in June as they faced a really difficult choice. Nina Shapiro reported the story, and Ramon Dampour also shot video. We've lived here in Hoquim since our kids have been born. I've lived here my whole life. I lived here for 18 years. All my wife's family is here. Part of my family is here. Even the friends are like family. So it's really, it's, it's going to be hard to leave. My dad passed away when I was 10 or 11. Things got so hard. I have to work. I have to quit the school. Sometimes we only have one meal a day. I was 17 or 16, and they talk about in the United States, they make pretty good money. And you know, I didn't really want to leave because that's my family, my mom. And, but I have to. I feel like I have to. We came into this story knowing that Juan had been ordered to leave the country by the end of June, and that the family wanted to stay together. But it was through spending time building trust with the family over the week we were there that we made this discovery. The decision that they made to stay together was not made out of fear. It was made out of love. This was a love story. Our work, as I've said, is about relationships. And the relationship between Erica and Juan is such a special one. Here's a scene from Juan's first doctor's appointment, last, sorry, doctor's appointment in Washington. Later on, I met, I met my wife. Yep, in 2000, uh, I mean, yeah, 2001. Mm -hmm. I think that's the best thing could happen to me. He's the strongest person I know that I've ever met. You really are. Um, I think you are. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I you mean, are very, I'm serious, the strongest person I've ever met. This photo is by Erica at SeaTac Airport. You can watch the complete stories for this and all the video clips that I showed today at seattletimes.com slash video. In journalism, people talk a lot about giving voice to the voiceless. Coming from a family of immigrants, I think I covered the story much differently than I would have otherwise. Because I know from personal experience that 
undocumented immigrants have never been voiceless. Journalists just haven't been listening. In 2019, we hope to continue listening, to keep telling stories like these, and to bring you stories about life beyond deportation. I mentioned a lot of photographers and videographers' names today, and this is truly a team effort to do this work. I feel blessed to collaborate with a really exceptional and talented team of photo and video journalists and storytellers at the Seattle Times. Here are our favorite video stories of 2018. It's almost like a slow motion place in your brain. The past is not dead, it's not even past. We have a very long way to go. It can happen again if we are not sensitive, if we are not careful. When we walk in the office, the eyes right away told me and my wife, you know what, we're going to detain him today. I just was like, please don't do this. My whole life's here. I really can relate to a lot of different scenarios and situations and people. Being able to fully understand what it's like, I know what it's like. The elders and the women who live in this house has given me strength and power to reclaim my, my life. We're teaching the kids that each person can make a difference. Something as simple as planting a tree. We need a superhero who's going to be fighting hate and bias. And that superhero is going to be either Asian or Jewish or Hispanic or sick. When it comes down to the wheel push against the wall, we just become superwomen, right? Like, I don't even know where the strength comes from. Just do what we have to do. In our ways, like the women are like the, the strong ones. They're like the, the backbone, pretty much. My great grandma, she's really represented that, and she means a lot to me. She was somebody who had a family. Sharing the story of Sabrina as much as possible. Hopefully, somebody will hear it that's in need and that their story won't end like ours did. A lot of people are like, oh, it must have been extra hard to have OCD and dance. When, for me, dance was an escape. The cool thing about moving to Seattle was like, nobody knows me and I can do and be whoever I want to be. I have that freedom to reinvent myself. I love being out on that board. It was a new sport and, and I thought I can take it on. I love the fact that we're growing something that goes into these great beers that we love, but then also brings a little bit of joy to somebody's life. Our sisters can't just go missing our brothers and nothing happens. That's why we're here today. Rosenda Strong's my sister, and I'm not going to stop looking for her. And neither will my family. We have to shed light to the darkness. We have to shed light to the darkness. Now we're gonna take questions for Alan and Corinne. Do you ask people before you take photos of them or do you just do it? <laughs> well, the, the question was whether um, you ask people if you take photos of them. It depends, it depends on the situation. Uh, with the homeless individuals, uh, I ask first. And uh, I like to be up close much more personal with a wide lens and I'll give out my business card and talk to them as if uh, I've talked to anybody and, and the way you get to make 
um, candid pictures, real pictures, is you hang out with them for quite a while. Uh, but others, depending on the situation, the feature situation, you can't, I don't ask ahead of time, uh, and I'll make the picture and then go up to them and get an ID and information. Uh, because otherwise the moment is lost. It, it, it's a balancing, it's a balancing act. And it's totally dependent on the situation. Uh, I've seen people photographing homeless people from across the street with a long lens, furtively. Uh, that's wrong. It's, that's not something I would do. I think it's completely wrong. Um, but with the, like the graduate student, I, I'm sorry, the students graduating at Seattle Pacific University, I'm just walking by and they're filled with joy and I made an image before ever talking to them and then found out who they were, what they're going to do in their future, where they're going. I think uh, one of the things that I admire so much about Alan and that you can see in really truly great photojournalism is that he has this uncanny ability to build trust with people really very quickly um, and as, as well they should because you're a very responsible photographer, but it, it is important to make sure that, you know, if you, if you are asking ahead of time, like you said, hang out, build that trust, and then you'll come up with really wonderful moments. Just in terms of talking about that a little more, I give out thousands of cards a year, and we in the photo department, I mean, we don't just represent ourselves, we represent the Seattle Times. and. In a larger measure, we represent the photographic community. So you need to be responsible in your actions and treat people with dignity. You had an opportunity to work in this industry both when film was literally film and transitioned to the digital age. When, when that transition took place, I mean, how did you have to change your style of shooting? Did you have to change it? No, did not at all. I don't, I don't think change, you change your style. What you do is, uh, well, I'll tell you what happened was, uh, I remember Cole Porter was director of photography. He handed me uh, on Friday to, uh, at that time, uh, very inadequate, but they were, the <laughs> they were of their time. And one day I was working on Martin Luther King Day. And uh, I just can't stand opening um, a technologic, uh, something uh, technological and going through a book this thick. And I went over to Barry Wong, a friend, and fellow photographer at the paper, and in four hours I learned what I needed to learn. To, because there's no resisting it, you have to go with it, you know, it's like I say, evolve or die. And it was not a problem. Uh, and you don't need to know everything that a camera can do, because I don't work at a camera store. I'm out on, you know, people at the camera stores don't even know everything a camera can do. Uh, Corrine. Hi. Turn. Um, my question is, so we've seen maybe 20, 30 photos. Uh, maybe uh, I'm wondering how many photos do you have to take in total to select like 30? To make the, how do you pick the, what's the ratio? If that well, there's, makes sense? <laughs> there, there's not a ratio. Um, it, it, you, you think of it as uh, working a situation. Uh, that's what I mean by solving the puzzle. You wade into this situation and you look at it from different angles. And um, if the more time you spend, especially if you're going back to a situation, people do things cyclically and you can anticipate stuff that's coming. But it, it's not a ratio of you'll shoot uh, hundreds of photos and pray that the one you need is in there because it won't be. It, you know, it's that, uh, so that's not really the approach. The approach is to try to study something in with people. You move in, you move back, you let them breathe a bit. You're not really on top of them the whole time. You have to let it kind of ebb and flow. And you don't have to be talking the entire time. You want them to become comfortable with you. And it's strange how very often the best one you regard as the best picture comes right at the beginning or it comes right at the end. It's, who knows? It just seems to happen that way a lot. I don't know if that answers your question. And I was curious for Corinne, do you want to apply that to video too? Like yeah. how much time do some of these video stories take to produce? Uh, I showed a bunch that took years today. That's really not typical. <laughs> um, the Seattle Storm one, we probably turned that around in like six hours from 
getting to the parade to putting it online. That's pretty unusual as well. Lopez family story was one of those where we didn't know what, what we would get, what, what kind of would unfold. We weren't sure what our story arc would be before we went in. So Erica and I, oh my gosh, I don't even know how much we shot for that. And wading through that footage was kind of a slog. But, um, but the way that we normally like to shoot things, would, I, would, I would say the powerlifter story is, is more along those lines where we have story meetings and we really plan out you know, what scenes will serve the story. Um, we kind of know it's coming, but it's always really nice to be surprised and pleasantly surprised by something that happens to us when we're behind the camera. And so the question was about like how prepared you can be and how much you just adjust to changing conditions, whether it's lighting or other things as well. Um, well, actually, for the powerlifter story, Erica shot the vast majority of that footage, and we knew that the gym was a windowless gym. And um, so we, we did strategize. She, she used a camera that she doesn't usually use for that. Um, so, so we were able to plan to a certain extent. Now, for something like powerlifting, where you know there's, they practice on Monday and Wednesday, and they have a meet on Saturday, that's easy to prepare for. Um, the Lopez family, we really didn't know what we were going to get. We weren't sure what their home looked like. We weren't sure what their days would look like or where they were going to go. Um, but, you know, we, we try to keep our kits pretty light and, and flexible. So, and Ramon shot a lot of that piece, too, while I was out of town. Um, but we, we just kept the same color profiles and adjusted to each situation. Does that kind of answer your question? Yes, uh, to Corinne. You mentioned something very interesting, which was when you say like minorities, not that they're voiceless, but that we, meaning you as journalists, have not been listening. That touched me somehow. But my, my, my question to you is, what is the situation right now? Or what is it, what's your part in it, in it? Or what's your intention? Or what's happening in the journalism community to, for us to help to start listening more? I would say that there's, there's a lot of conversation and discussion being had about the role of diversity, equity, and inclusion in journalism right now. Unfortunately, a lot of that conversation is being had by very few people. And one of the reasons is that in the journalism industry, it's just not a very diverse industry. Um, there are a lot of reports you can look up. Um, the Kerner Commission, the ASNE annual report, where you can actually see how diversity has changed over time. And I, I'm not sure the exact number off the top of my head, but I think we're only in the single digits of percentage more diverse than we were 20 years ago. Um, that being said, I think that especially with um, the political atmosphere of today and our ability to converse over the internet and connect with people all the way across the world and around the country, I think that a lot of the discussion that's, be that's happening is is really thought-provoking and productive. And um, one thing that we do at the Seattle Times is that I am one of the leaders of our diversity and inclusion task force. And we actually look at internally, what are we doing, how are we doing, and how can we make it better? So we, all, we look at our coverage. Are we doing it responsibly? Are we representing a variety of people? Are we reflecting our community? And we also have discussions about the makeup of our newsroom. And does our newsroom reflect our community? Uh, are the demographics similar, or are they so far apart that we're just missing the boat? So um, our newsroom is, is doing that. Uh, we have a diversity statement online that you can look up. Many other newsrooms are starting to engage in this work. Um, and I think, you know, I feel optimistic. Uh, so I think those last two stories, at least for me, were really impactful. Um, but my question is around how do you, kind of in this era of tribalism and gated media gardens, how do you guys breach that and expose uh, populations to these ideas, to these experiences that you're trying to show? I think for me, um, you know, this is obviously, if you, you know, from my talk, you could probably see this is something I'm thinking about really, really hard all the time. And for me, that's why being in a local market is so interesting and inspiring because I think that it's a lot harder for somebody in this Seattle community that we all belong to, that I belong to, to 
you know, to, to treat me with any sort of hostility or to be closed-minded about the stories that we're trying to pursue. I think it's a lot easier if you're coming in from a national or international publication to be rebuffed and pushed aside or to be judged. And, um, and, I, and I think that that's really what I value about being able to live and work in Seattle and be a part of the community. And I'd actually really love to hear what you have to say about this, Alan, because I think that you, the perspective you have is really... Well, first, people have a right to say no. We don't have uh, an inherent right into people's lives. People have a choice if they don't want to let us in, uh, particularly with, uh, I don't know, you know how to phrase it, people in challenging situations. And you tell them what the goal would be to, uh, to reveal and explain and uh, enlighten. And... You build trust over time, if you can, if you have time, um, that you'll treat them with dignity. You try to explain the bigger picture of how important this issue is, and uh, if they'll let us in, we want to be able to explain it through their eyes, through your eyes, in a personal way. I think that's a really good point. I think um, that made me think that. I think traditionally as journalists, we've, we've approached storytelling as, you know, here's the news. We're going to tell you what the news is. And I think more and more important is to explain to the people that appear in our stories and that we cover what the impact is or could be of our work. And that's not really something that we always had access to um, before the internet. You just printed it and it went out and it was published. Now we have feedback channels. We've got social media. Um, and I think that just the reach of our work is so much greater and we're hearing a lot more about it. So I think really just being transparent about potential impacts of our work is an important part of our job. So we have time for a few more questions. Please raise your hand and we'll try to get a mic to you or if, go ahead and shout it out. I'm just curious, Seattle Times is a newsprint. I don't often think of Seattle Times as video. Uh, is there a relationship between the time and like television in any way, or how do we, uh, I don't use a lot of social media, so if I don't look at it, uh, but I do get the Times, I read the Times on the pad, but uh, I don't see any way to put yeah. video to me. And so the question was about how we use video and whether we have partnerships with other broadcasters. Um, I should say that tonight we're partnering with Seattle Channel and this will be uh, broadcast. We do occasionally um, partner with um, the various TV stations, but what we're creating, I think that what we're creating is really unique to online. And a lot of these experiences that we've shown, they really live as a complete online package. And so we do believe that with print, you are getting a very robust view of news, but online we can just do so much more. And so all, our video storytelling doesn't always translate well to TV broadcast news. Um, and so it's often I would say that the best way to experience it is to engage with us online. We, we try and print, we try to put little ref, uh, references to say, you know, for more of this story to see us online. I think the best thing that I can do would be to encourage you to uh, follow us online and be looking for those packages there. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. So, oh. I can just talk loud. It's, fine. it's, work, it's working. Yeah. Um, so, uh, in the case of when it comes to creating a narrative, does the photo and video always follow the story? No. The question was about the relationship between the photos, the videos, and the story, and how that narrative works together. And which comes first? I would say it really depends. Um, more and more, we're, we're initiating our own uh, visual enterprise, meaning that we initiate some of the stories. And sometimes, I mean, for example, the power lifters was something that Erica came up with, and we got a writer on it. Um, a lot of the times it does happen the opposite way, but kind of in reference to the last question, um, stories like Artifacts of Injustice and Under Our Skin, those are kind of conceived as a whole together. So the answer is all of the above, uh, in short. But I think, that, I think that's 
the way that it should be and the way that I, I love to work and collaborate. Yeah, it depends. What we do, uh, visual reporters, I do not think of what we do as providing evidence of what the text says. Uh, it can go in another direction, it can intersect, it can be parallel. Uh, it, it, it does depend on the, on the piece and I think uh, the Times is uh, more, sophi more sophisticated than many places and uh, that's clear by the nine staff photographers and the three videographers and the people who support us, picture editors and production people. And we hope, of course, the higher management yeah. who are here in greater numbers than they've ever been here before. Thank you, Mitch and Don, wherever yeah. you are. I would say that when we think about story, we think about that entire experience. And so text and photo and video, design, interactive elements, like that's story. And we think about um, for each story that we want to tell, how to engage each one of those uh, media the best way. So that when you leave it, you get a well-rounding of what each of those can do and bring to that story experience. Yeah. That means it seems like a <laughs> that has a finality to it. <laughs>